Hi, I'm Bea Kupin, and this is 36 Years, where we talk about Philippine news, politics, and democracy. On May 9, 2022, last year, the Philippines elected Ferdinand Marcos Jr. as president. He is the second Marcos to hold the post, the first being his father, the dictator who was ousted from power on February 25, 1986 in the People Power Revolution. That was 36 years ago. Here, we try to answer the question, where is Philippine democracy heading 36 years after the revolution? Happy New Year. We have a lot of catching up to do. I've been pretty MIA since December 2022. So let's start 2023, right? Welcome to 36 Years, available on Rappler social media pages and on wherever you listen to podcasts. This week in Philippine politics and news, a trip to Jerusalem in the defense sector, a trip to snowy and glitzy Davos in Switzerland, and boy, oh boy, ang mahal mabuhay. If you go grocery shopping or pumunta ka sa palengke, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. It's been a doozy of headlines this month and January isn't even over yet. This week on 36 Years, I speak to Ana Santos. She's a journalist and on a personal note, the very first person I ever produced an online talk show for, also for Rappler, uh, about the Marcos labor policy. I'm not just talking about the current Marcos, but the President Marcos of decades past, the first President Marcos actually, uh, the dictator, the father of the current president. It was during President Ferdinand Marcos Sr.'s term as president that labor export turned into state policy. Back then, it was a way to address two problems, uh, yung shortage or yung lack of jobs in the Philippines, also yung economic crisis, kaya kailangan din ng uh, pumapasok na pera sa Pilipinas. Decades later, labor export continues to be Philippine government policy, our greatest export, in fact. Hence the title of this week's show. But there are costs and downsides to this policy. Uh, and Anna and I talk about this the emotional and social toll on the families uh, that are left behind and the family members who are forced to leave. Uh, there's also the many vulnerabilities of our kababayans. Uh, when they are abroad, the lack of protections, not to mention the lack of safety guards, not just in the land where they work in, yung kakulangan ng protections, like labor policies that protect, uh, that, that ensure their well-being, but also um, when they come back home, what is there waiting for them? Ano yung social safety nets? A lot of times, or in this discussion with Anna, um, we talk about how they leave because they're forced to, because of dire straits, and when they come here, um, kumbaga, a lot of our uh, kababayans face the same dire situation. It's a fascinating and ultimately sobering discussion with a journalist who has gone around the world, not just to pour over the numbers, pour over the data, but also to speak um, to OFWs and find out why they made that hard choice and why it's some, in many cases it's not even a choice to make to leave. But first, the headlines. Listen, back in November 2022, President Marcos, we were in Bangkok. No, we were in Phnom Penh, if I'm not mistaken. He was telling the traveling media that he wasn't sure about attending the World Economic Forum in Davos because it would be, quote, too much traveling and because he wanted to make sure that if he did go to Davos, to the WEF, that he would have something to say when he did face the world's political and economic elite. Well, he has clearly changed his mind because as we are recording this, as I'm talking to you, Marcos and a delegation, mostly of legislators and members of his economic team, as well as businessmen, top executives, are in snowy Switzerland to attend the 2023 edition of the annual meeting. What does he plan to do there? Well, according to himself and to the DFA, it's a soft launch ng proposed and controversial Maharlika Wealth Fund. And yung soft launch, soft launch siya kasi um, it's not actually in existence yet. It hasn't even been discussed in the Senate. We've talked about this proposed fund before and how it's changed. Originally, uh, yung source seed fund ng Maharlika Sovereign Wealth Fund ay manggagaling sa pensions uh, ng mga tao, mga Filipinos, both private and public. But now it would be, and how it would be headed by the president initially, yung wealth fund na yun, 
uh, and how things have changed amid criticism from within Congress and outside of it. Uh, most notably, nga, binago na yung source ng seed fund. So the Marlika Wealth Fund, a uh, very clear reference to the first Marcos president's regime, is a sovereign wealth fund that will get its source money from government banks. That's the one major change, uh, one of the many major changes that they made since. Uh, and that money would be used to invest in big ticket projects before. Yung proposal was for it to be headed by the president. Now it's going to be headed by uh, the finance chief who reports to the president. The proposed fund sponsors, many of them relatives of the president, who hold leadership positions in the House of Representatives especially, say it's time for the fund and that the same the, that safeguards are in place um, amid yung worries na ma-abuse, ma yung uh, vulnerabilities to corruption. But then you consider this. Inflation in December 2022 hit a 14-year high, driven mostly by the cost of food. While the Philippines and most of East Asia are expected to dock a global recession in 2023, we aren't exactly expected to flourish, at least according to the projections of experts. So is it time for a sovereign wealth fund? And should the president be focusing on this, uh, on soft launching it rather, in Davos? We will be covering his five-day visit to Davos, albeit remotely, so keep it on Rappler. If you're watching this week's or months after January 2023 or after the president leaves Davos, I suggest you take a look back at Marcus's WEF excursion. This, of course, is Marcus's eighth trip in his first seven months of office, he's been to Indonesia, Singapore, the U.S., back to Singapore, if you count the Grand Prix attendance as an official trip. He's been to Phnom Penh, to Bangkok, Brussels, and China, his first state visit in 2023, and his first state visit outside of Southeast Asia. Meanwhile, back in Manila, we are still dealing from the whiplash of a defense sector shake-up in personnel. First, Marcos, in a strange move, brought back General Andres Centino as Chief of the Armed Force of the Philippines to replace Lieutenant General Bartolome Bacaro, uh, Marcos's first AFP chief who served from August 2022 to early January 2023. So in effect, Marcos took Centino, a four-star general, out as AFP chief, leaving him on floating status. Ibig sabihin, he is a top-ranking official, the only four-star general in the AFP without a position. And then he was appointed envoy to India, only for Marcos to bring him back in January 2023, a month shy of Centina's 56th birthday in February 2023, or when he would have been uh, re required to leave the military service because of a new law. This means that Centino, barring uh, an early appointment of a new AFP chief, uh, can serve the post for three years. And then the weekend after that, there were rumors of destabilization after top defense department officials supposedly resigned from their posts. Yet it be clarified a few days later that at least one official did resign, Jose Faustino Jr., a former AFP chief who was Marcos's first defense uh, chief, but only as officer in charge from June 2022 to January 2023. Oh, I see Shah because they had to wait until November 2022 for him to be eligible to be a full cabinet official because he had they had to wait the one year my one year ban um ng appointments for those who for officers leaving uh, the armed forces but in November 2022 he wasn't appointed a full Secretary of the Defense Department, and said he remained OIC. Faustina said he resigned because he was kept out of the loop in Centino's return as AFP chief. Carlito Galvez, who was Marcos's advisor for Peace and Unity, is now the new defense chief. He is a secretary, a full cabinet secretary. And then just this weekend, Marcos swore a new national security advisor into office. Eduardo Año, former DA secretary, was appointed secretary. Director General, rather, of the National Security Council. That's the agency that deals with all things security in the Philippines, from anti-insurgency, anti-terror effort to the situation in the West Philippine Sea. 
Marcos said political scientist Clarita Carlos, his first NSA chief, found the post too political. She has since been sent to a congressional office that Marcos's cousin, Speaker Martin Romualdez, is about to form. By the way, five out of the six people I mentioned, uh, Centino, Bacaro, Faustino, Galvez, and Anya, have been AFP chiefs at one point in their careers. Well, uh, except for Bacaro, well, actually, including Bacaro, um, AFP chief was their last post in the military. Centino, he, he will be holding the post twice. A first in a very, very long time. Carlos w was the first woman and a uh, member of the academe in a very, very long time to, to head the NSC because usually that post is held by either a former military man or a politician. A full round of changes in defense leaders to kick off the year. What does 2023 have in store yet for all of us? We will find out in the next 11 months, I guess. Anyway, on to the interview. Hi, Anna. Thank you for joining me today. Ilang taon na since last we saw each other in person. Pre-pandemic. Tapos natatawa ako sa'yo pa na nag-email ka sa'yo. Ano to si Bea? Akala ba niya hindi ka magkakilala? <laughs> Kaya the, na, I post a ganyan ganyan. <laughs> for the people who are watching or listening, <laughs> I started in Rappler producing a show for Anna on, would you believe, Google Hangouts. That was, it's, it doesn't exist anymore. It's a product that no longer exists. So we were talking about Sexuality, oh, right? Yeah. We were reflecting yeah. on that earlier. Ang ganda namang guests natin. We had, <laughs> we had trans men, remember? Yeah. Yeah. Na, na, yung isa tinanong pa, saan yung bathroom? Tapos sabi, saan ko sasabihin? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, no. The, the very different time. Pero in yeah. retrospect, working on that show, we did a lot of episodes, right? Like almost 10 or less than, less than 10 probably. But like, less than quite 10. a lot. Yeah. Right. Sayang nga yun eh. Dapat kinarir pa natin. We'll, Wala that. Na we'll work on that soon. <laughs> <laughs> De, pero, but for this episode, naman, we're talking about something that another topic that you've been focusing on the past few years which mm -hmm. is uh, labor. And I think, siguro, let's roll out muna the statistics. I wouldn't want to call them boring, pero nga, in, in the Philippine context, um, it's often said without irony, sometimes pride. Yeah. Na our biggest export, our greatest export, in, in, in their words, means then, is our people, which, like, there, the numbers back that up because in 2021, $31.4 billion in cash remittances, mm -mm -mm. around 9% of GDP, GDP so yeah. almost one-tenth of GDP natin, galing sa remittances ng ng greatest export. Um, on the surface, like, yeah, wow, pride. Uh, it's a great thing na 9% of our economy is from that. But what happened? How, how did we reach that point? Alam mo, Bea, when I started covering labor and migration, parang, habi ko, saan nga ba tayo nanggaling? And we've always thought of, or me at least, I've always thought of na, lahat tayo may OFW sa pamilya. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So, hindi ko na inisip masyado how it started. How it started. Yeah. And then when I started reporting on labor migration issues, super interesting, way back in the galleon trade, yeah. our ancestors would get on the galleons, yeah. the ships, uh, flying the route of Manila and Acapulco oh. and would literally jump ship. Okay. Tapos doon na siya magsasettle. So ito yung mga time ng Spanish. Yeah. Naman, mga time naman ng mga Americans. Yeah. So this is the stories of the saga sacadas, right? Okay. The, yeah. the, our, our manongs or our, our men also who would sail over to the U.S. Mm. and work in Hawaii and yeah. in plantations. This was covered in the book of Carlos Bolosan, mm -hmm. America's Not in the Heart. Yeah. So after that, ito na naman tayo, naging nung period of 1970s, under the period of Marcos Sr. The first Marcos president. The first yeah. Marcos president. Yeah. My gosh. Uh, Nag-initiate siya ng labor export program. Kasi at the time, there were not enough jobs. So it was supposed to be a job creation measure by sending our people abroad to where the jobs are. At the same time, in the 70s, the place that needed jobs was Saudi, the Middle East. You know, they were just building what we see now as the Middle East. So you see, the, when we think of overseas Filipino worker, mga katas ng Saudi pa na iisip natin, hindi ba? It was because they were the our men who were manning the oil rigs, mm -hmm. Be working at the construction sites in the Middle Eastern cities that we now have just have now see, mm -mm. and then from there on, 
we we went where the jobs were. Yeah. And it was mostly ko ano yung demand ng ibang countries. Yun ang sino supply natin. Yeah. That's why you'll see okay, may shortage of nurses. Wow, yeah. biglang magbuboom yung yeah. nursing schools. Yeah. And and this isn't just like um, parang natural. It, it becomes policy, right? Like yes. government specifically says na let's train more nurses because yes. there there's a need for nurses in this specific country or exactly. Yeah. If you remember during the time of Gloria Macapagal Arroyo, she was actually the president who said now we have a target of of deploying a million Filipino workers. Yeah. Yung talagang policy siya yeah. of exporting our people yeah. for the purpose of Employing them, yes, but also for the remittances yeah. that they send back home. Yeah. Because we don't have the resources to employ yeah. them here. Yeah. But it's a, it solves two problems. The, two of the government's problems. Kung baga na walang trabaho available. At kailangan natin na mas malaking kita. Or kailangan na mas malaking pera pumasok sa bansa natin. Mm-hmm. Yeah. At saka, our, our OFWs are so low. Yun, yun talaga, di ba? Magpapadala at magpapadala uh-huh. sa pamilya. Mm-mm. So, ma- maaasahan mo Mm-mm. na regular silang magpapadala, walang palya, may mga yeah. naghihintay dito dun sa, at umaasa sa kanila. Yeah. So, magpapadala at magpapadala sila yeah. ng pera. Yeah. And in fact, until now, kasi I, I cover uh, the second Marcos president, yes. diba? When, when he interfaces with the Filipino community in his many travels, he has traveled a lot in his first seven months in office, parati niyang line talaga yan na salamat na, at nagrimit kayo even during the lockdowns. Mm-mm. So parang you see, yes, it's something that that people almost take for granted. Yes, which which leads me to wonder, like, is this specifically a Philippine thing? Na parang we we lean so heavily on importing our labor, importing our talents as a as a huge source of our GDP, of our of of our wealth as a country. Well, I think one one. I, I'm not sure if your question is about the, the sending back of remittances, ba? Um, parang just the parang kumpaga institutionalization ah. of exporting our talent, exporting our labor, um, ah, okay. and leaning into. Eh, parang two prong narin siya. Parang it's beyond exporting our labor. Yung parang leaning into that yeah. um, as a means to fuel our economy. Yeah. Well, for sure, the the Philippines is like one of the few countries yeah. that really has a labor export policy na naka-enshrine mm-hmm. sa mga laws natin. At hindi lang yon. You see the infrastructure, right? Meaning, that's why you have that POEA building yeah. along EDSA. Yeah. That's why you have offices like Overseas Welfare, yeah. Workers Association, all of these things. Naka, naka-map out talaga siya for the, so, the sending out, the yeah. training yeah. Of, our, of, our, of our countrymen to work as migrant workers abroad. Mm-mm. We're one of the few that has that kumbaga supply chain uh-uh. down pat. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. I mean, like, even the fact that we have a specific department, hindi lang siya ahen siya, we have a specific department for migrant workers, yes. says a lot about how our policy has been shaped through the years and also how it's not going to change, I'm guessing? I don't think it's going to change because all the more... Look at what's happening. Apart from, we still haven't solved that issue that first sent out our OFWs, yung lack of jobs. Mm-mm. Pero yeah. nadagdagan pa, ba? Nadagdagan pa ng climate crisis. Yeah. And where are they going to go? Kung lahat yung binabahan na ng palagi yung mga villages natin, yung coastal areas natin, it's, it's becoming untenable for them to live there. Yeah. Tapos at the same time, yung question na nga ngayon ng mga other climate scientists that I've talked to is, yung nagmamigrate tayo to escape the climate crisis para magpadala ng pera dun sa mga relatives natin nandito, pero yung mga countries na pinupuntahan natin, nagsasuffer na rin ng climate crisis. Mm-mm. Where are we going to go? Right. So, those things, if you zoom out to what's happening on the, on, from the bigger picture, I think talagang patuloy at patuloy pa rin tayo magpapadala ng mga kababayan natin para magtrabaho sa ibang bansa. Yeah. This might be. This is probably a simplistic question, but why can't we solve? What What is stopping, or why can't Philippine government solve that basic problem? Then, na there's not enough jobs here. Or actually, it's not even just not enough jobs. No. Eh. The jobs that we do have here are sorry, pero pathetic yung pay given like, in exchange for the skill that that yeah. uh, a person offers, right? Or the yeah. skill set that the person has. Parang in the recent couple of days, you've seen all of these headlines about. Uh, we didn't have enough airport 
controllers yeah. or airport workers because yeah. they were being pirated yeah. to work abroad. Yeah, well, though, uh, exactly. Times 10 or more. The Weather Bureau, if you look at yeah. that same theme, our Weather Bureau, the same. We we lost a number of weather yeah. specialists. It napaka typhoon, natural yeah. disaster, um, vulnerable natin. And yeah. then we're losing our weather forecasters and these specialists to the other countries that will pay them 10 times yeah. more. Yeah. Diba? Who can blame them? Who can blame them nga? Pero, isa yon yung low pay nun. Pero, yung, when I talk to our, our OFWs, nare-realize ko yung pinaka-problema is yung contractualization. Mm. They only have like five or six months working for a job. So, hindi ka pa tapos, kailangan mo na maghanap ng iba pang job. And when are you going to do that? Yeah. Kapag nagtatrabaho ka pa? Yeah. When are you gonna do that? Tapos, if you have a gap in between, Mm-mm. You're already, as you said, our wages are so low. Yeah. You're not making enough yeah. to save up just yeah. a bit of a safety yeah. net. There's no, there's no such thing. There's no such thing. you live paycheck, paycheck to paycheck, hindi paycheck to paycheck. Yes. Day by day lang yung pag ano ng so, budget ng mga tao. Magkakaroon ka ng gap sa employment. Ang hirap makahabol, di ba? Yeah. One month ka lang mawala ng sweldo, mm-hmm. mahirap na makahabol. Mm-hmm. So, those are the issues apart from, it's simple. I would I would think we need to go beyond. Okay, low pay, yes, of course. Pero paano na yung contractualization? Yeah. Paano na yung landlessness ng mga farmers natin? Just to be able to eat, right? To, to yeah. farm and plant what you can eat. Hindi dapat nagugutom yung mga magsasaka natin. Yeah. Yeah. And then also thinking about it na, teka, may iba pang mga other factors na nagko-contribute. Itong climate crisis, napaka-serious, di ba? It's always driven us away. Yeah. From, from even to move from the province here to Manila. Yeah. Right? Just yeah. to get a better job. And eh, pa, pa paano na? We really have to think, I think, a long game view on, on our labor export or migration policy. Mm-hmm. I find it to be very reactive. We're yeah. focused on, okay, may na abuse. Or, okay, may, meron tayong issue ngayon about the renewal of certifications of our seafarers. Yeah. So we're just fixing those issues. As but, they come. As they come. But what about the issues that make us leave? Yeah. Kung bagay yung pinaka pinaka unang tanong hindi pa nasasagot. Yes. Uh-oh. At sabi na nga natin 36 years na, yeah. de ba itong era natin yeah. of exporting our labor. Mm-hmm. When is the government going to actually see if this is helping? Yeah. yeah. Kasi yes, they send back money and remittances and all that. But I have been to our embassies, for example, in the Middle East where there's a lot of exploitation and abuse. It's it, to be fair to the government. Yeah. Ano din, uh, may shelter tayo doon, tapos um, binabahay yung mga, yung mga workers natin, so they're provided with food, shelter, etc., mm-hmm. then they're sent back home. And I would look at the operation and think, how much money are we yeah. spending for this? I'm not saying that we shouldn't. Huh? Yeah, yeah. But again, to think of like the viability yeah. of this policy of ours. Mm-mm. And we haven't even started talking about the impact on the family. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So it's time also that we think about our migration policy. Yeah. From that whole perspective of how come we keep sending our people away? Yeah. And what is it doing? Not just to the to you know to the to the families abroad. I'm sorry, the families that are left behind here. The talent that we lose, Mm-mm. but also like the total cost of it. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and taking care of them yeah. while they are abroad. But it's not just, uh, and we can talk about that later, it's mm-hmm. not just like an individual uh, specific trauma. It, it's almost become a generational trauma in a way. I mean, it's in a way, right? Oh, oh. It's generational yung trauma. Na yun. but, but before we um, jump into that, you mentioned it kanina, ba? A 36-year-old policy in that, as in like, literal na institutionalized government Yung, um, when the president, President Marcos, the second President Marcos, was in Bangkok, he had a bilateral meeting with um, Saudi's MBS. Yes. Um, isa sa mga major talk points sila doon, and, and they seem very proud of it. No? Nung parang, um, well, one thing was that they, they flaunted the promise of Saudi to pay yung unpaid workers natin. Wala pang, uh, wala pang follow-up nun, or wala pang... Mm-hmm confirmation if the money actually went through and then distribute pan. But but beyond that, there was also talk about a building boom. Right? Na parang, and that's another potential. But siguro in the thirty six years, um, since Ferdinand the dictator 
um, institutionalized labor export as policy. What what has changed and what hasn't? In how in the realities of our OFWs. Wow, that's such a <laughs> yeah. It's so hard to what has changed. Uh -oh. In terms of being able to send out people, we're still doing it. Yeah. Now, uh, when when I was studying the patterns of migration, mm -hmm. that it was the fathers that were leaving. Because mm -hmm. the demand of jobs. Mm -hmm. But again, in the Western world, uh, they started you know, having dual income households. Yeah. They also started outsourcing who would take care of the house and the domestic duties here. So now you have families where both parents are working abroad. Uh -oh. And then the who takes care of of the children who are left behind? Uh -oh. It's usually the 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 grandparents or or the older siblings. So I see that talagang fragmented yeah. yung Filipino family natin. Secondly, meron na tayong intergenerational OFWs. Yeah. Intergenerational na talaga yung OFWs natin. It's become na, na an aspiration na. Yeah. Ano gusto mo maging paglaki mo? OFW, yeah. mag-abroad. Yeah. But I will tell you also that in Europe, Europe is, is becoming old. Mm -mm. Uh, it's demography, it's, it's entering its demographic winter. They need younger talent. Yeah. So you will see, this is uh, just a hunch, but let's see, let's put it out here and let's see if I'm right mm -mm. in the next few years. There's a trend now across Europe where they are relaxing migration laws yeah. to recruit younger and younger talent. So I see a lot of very young Filipinos and, and other from, residents from other countries who are migrants themselves. Right. And we're talking about 24-year-olds who are, you know, lured by the sense of adventure. Iba pa yung mga digital nomads, ha? So these are spe uh, special skilled workers. I'd like to see where that goes. Yeah. Because that's where I see we are moving, to my, moving or migrating to work because of choice. Mm. Not because of this desperation, yeah. and not because Kapit of. Kapit sa patalim. Oh oh. Concept na minsan. At nagkakover tayo na mga OFWs. Yun talaga yung minsan na papalulun sa kanila na oh mag mag traffic sila, malululun sila sa utang, kasi they're very desperate yeah. to leave. Yeah. I think parang it seems like only it na bagay pero when you think about it na when you actually have the choice yeah. to work abroad and it's your choice to do so, yeah. you have so much more agency. Yeah. And latitude to make your 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 job work yeah. versus someone who has to leave now because yeah. their family depends on them because wala nang ibang option. Yeah. And that's where I'd like to see where this goes. Hopefully, mas mapuntat pa tayo dun sa ruta na yon na yeah. we migrate because there are better options. Yes, but also because we want to. Yeah. Yung irony dito na parang pinili niyang mag abroad pero hindi talaga siya pile in the sense that it's not a choice when you're basically shepherded into that. Because of hardships in 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 your reality in the Philippines. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Tapos yung yun nga parang ganon. How sustainable is that? Isa pa yon ba yah? The other thing, uh, when I started covering migration, mm -mm. I meron tayong mga 36 years na di ba? Yeah. So isipin natin yung mga manong natin who started going out nung kasagsagan kabataan nila. They're 25 maybe, 36. So how old would they be? Yeah. Right? They'll probably be, help me with the math, they'll probably be in their 50s now, yeah. right? But, nasa na malaking mga, pinakamalaking population natin ng mga OFWs, they are in the Middle East, yeah. or in Hong Kong, yeah. or in Singapore, where you never get a path to citizenship. Yeah. Babalik at babalik sila dito. Yeah. Anong babalikan nila, bay? Right. Are they going to just return to the, to the poverty that, yeah. or to the dire economic situations yeah. that they wanted to escape? But this time, much older yeah. and no longer employable. Yeah. That's where I want the government to look. Yeah. Yeah. For so many years, they've been sending remittances loyally, yeah. the families, keeping our economy afloat. Yeah. What are we going to do when, when they age into retirement? Because yeah. they don't have a retirement plan in, in, in a lot of cases. No? Kasi Contrata. Like, not, yeah. Contrata sila. Yeah. Diba? Contrata yeah. two, three years contract, yeah. etc. And then in these countries, you don't have a chance yeah. for citizenship. No, and I'm thinking also, para isipin yung mga tao, but but di kayo nag-save. Hindi din ganun kalaki minsan ha yung yung. I mean, like their salaries aren't that. They're higher definitely than yes. salaries in the Philippines. Yes. But you have to remember that when they send money, right? Like, hindi din hindi kung bakit hindi siya path na maging to to being a millionaire or whatever. Hindi talaga. Yeah. And let's remember, 
I'm from a middle, very middle class yeah. family. Uh, pag nagsisiba ko, iniisip ko, magkasakit lang po ako. Yeah. Wala yeah. na to. One major, hindi nga major eh, kahit minor illness na requires a lot of yes. uh, a long hospitalization. You're no, just one sickness na. away nga daw from having your savings wiped out. Yeah. So, I don't see that as a... As, hindi viable mag-ipon. Yeah. Of course, we want to do that. Yeah. Pero the reality is nga, because we have no social... Our, our, our social protection systems are so weak, everybody will get sick. Yeah. And we're all just one sickness away yeah. from having our yeah. savings wiped out. I have a question that kind of touches on your... Kumbaga, the ideal dream na parang migration... Labor export becomes a choice. Yeah. Migration becomes a choice. Uh, leaving the Philippines becomes a choice. Parang, I've always wondered this. Parang, karugtong na rin siguro na parang, siguro we grew up taking for granted the fact na maraming OFW. Parating may OFW. Uh-uh. More or less, kung walang OFW sa family, immediate family mo, sa extended, for sure meron. Um, bakit nga ba? Ang, saan galing yung term na OFW? And why does it seem to connote to only be associated with blue collar work. Like, saan nang galing yun? Na? Ba- di ba, yun yung naalala ko years back. Ito yung debate. Bakit kung blue collar, OFW, uh-huh. tapos kung parang some cushy, siguro na office job, oh, uh, expat. expat. Oh, like, saan, saan galing yung, yung, yung difference in, in terms na yun? And to, interesting trivia. So, yeah. nag-umpisa tayo, the term na overseas contract worker. Oh, so oh, that's OCW. Sadder. <laughs> yeah, that's a sadder term though. A little sadder. Yeah. Pero meron din siyang political, yeah. you know, policy implication. Because parang kung wala kang kontrata, meaning undocumented mm. ka or whatnot, paano ka tutulungan ng government? So it kind of became na when you look at the history of this, oh. paano ka maassist ng government kung overseas contract worker ang classification pero wala kang kontrata. Oh wow. So they renamed it to OFW, Overseas oh. Filipino Worker, oh. meaning na basta Filipino ka and you run into any kind of problems yeah. or any sort of issue that happens, kailangan kang tulungan ang embahada natin. I don't know how to feel about that bit of history. <laughs> pero interesting, yeah. 'di ba? Yeah. Napaka-interesting niya. Ah, oh. So, binago siya to cover those who... So, it was an acknowledgement also. Now we, well, I wouldn't... I would, I'm, I, to be honest, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have seen or I didn't get to research that uh-huh. deep enough into it to see na acknowledgement siya. Parang ako mas nakita ko siya as nakita ng government na, okay, meron tayong mga kababa, I think, I don't know, mga kababayan na kailangan ng tulong, pero wala silang papeles, yeah. hindi naman pwedeng hindi matulungan yung yeah, ga- sure. mga kababayan natin. Yeah. So, yeah, I I hope that was the reason. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. mas mukha siyang mas inclusive yeah. Yeah. na pag sinabi mong, oh, basta, basta Pilipino yan at kailangan ng Tutulungan tulong, yan. may tungkulin yung gobyerno natin sa iba't yeah. ibang bansa na tulungan sila. Yeah. Yeah. Nilatag mo kanina yung, kumbaga, the vision, the, the ideal, an idealized or an ideal vision mm. of, of migration for Filipinos in the future. But the way policies are uh, like being laid out now, um, which is funny to say, because it's seven months now, but being laid out. Pa rin tayo. I mean, like, the context being, Marcos didn't really have a clear, no, he did not have a platform when he was running for president. So parang, although the, his migration pol- labor export policy was one of the few c- clear things mm. when he was still a candidate, now basically in favor, siya, like he wants to... Um, of course. Push. And, and it's been actualized no, in his bilateral. Wala pang, policy-wise, hindi pa clear. Pero th- you see it in the way that he reports his bilateral meetings, right? Like, um, yung optimism dun sa discussion with Saudi na magkakaroon ng uh, construction boom. Oh, that's an opportunity for Filipinos. Mm, 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 mm. So, and, and then, second, yun nga, parang this will be the first fiscal year na may sariling budget na ang Department of Migrant Workers. Yes. Operationally, it... it eases the burden of the DFA of the embassies, right? Parang si DM, DMW na yung... Yeah, DMW na yung, yung um, will take primary responsibility in responding to our uh, OFWs documented, undocumented abroad. Where do you think our policy is heading? Given ito nga, parang nagkaroon na tayo ng department to handle migrant workers. Mm. 
I think that's an indication, again, of how we want to continue the inst institutionalization of our migration policy. Yeah. Well, and secondly, Marcos Jr., yeah. he's always lauded the past achievements yeah. of the former dictatorship, except to acknowledge, of course, the, the human rights atrocities and the, the pillaging of our, of our national coffers, right? But everything else, he acknowledges as achievements or he touts as achievements mm -hmm. of his father. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the really hallmarks and long enduring policies yeah. of the Marcos Sr. administration. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's something that's going to continue. I am so cautious. I'm watching, you know, this, this agreement with Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. For a long time already, the migrant worker groups have been flagging us. Yeah. Saudi one has rolling, been rolling out a Saudization program mm -hmm. or a national program where they want to employ and place preference on their nationals mm -hmm. over mm -hmm. foreign workers. Okay. So we saw that already na may mga workers na nawawala ng trabaho. Our migrant worker groups have been flagging us about that. And then this kind of took a toll already during the pandemic na and dami ng close bigla ng mga construction companies and they just left. Yeah. And that's why you have this problem of we had so many of our workers who are, okay, how are we going to get paid? Yeah. Right? How are we going to get paid? And how are we going to run after these contractors who just left the country? Without protections. Yes, what are in protections? So when, when, uh, when MBS says that there's going to be a building boom, I would ask, you know, we have to ask the right questions. Who are you going to employ? Yeah. And, and secondly, have you paid those people that you already employed before? Yeah. Or that was, because we stop at the promise, yeah. right? Who is tracking now? How are we going to track if this was actually paid? Yeah. Remember also, mga OFWs natin, umuwi sila dito, napapauwi sila. May bilyaso, may problem, di ba? Papauwi sila. Then when they try to work out issues here, magsasampa sila ng kaso or whatever. Antagal. Yeah. Kailangan nila umalis na ulit. Yeah. Because again, there is no there's not enough jobs to keep them here. San san sila hahanapin na ulit. It's such a vicious cycle. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Of of not being able to provide jobs here that are jobs that are decent. Yeah. That will employ you for a reasonable amount of time so that you don't just keep on jumping from one job to another and actually try to build some kind yeah. of employment for yourself. Yeah. Para ma uplift mo yung sarili mo. Building towards something. And hopefully yeah. also building something for uh, your children. If you have children, right? Mm -mm. Um, you touched on this earlier nga. Yung parang nagkakaroon na ng phenomenon of generational, like intergenerational na yung OFWs. And you, you mentioned it um, in passing kanina, no? Yung the trauma yeah. of the migration policy. Can you talk a little more about that? Like, what, what, what has 36 years of this being policy caused um, or what damage has it done to the Filipino child, Filipino family? I think I'll, I'll, this is such a touchy subject and, and I'm a mom too. So, yeah. I mean, I'd like to preface first by saying that we are not blaming any of our yeah. OFW parents for having to make choices to work abroad mm. and not be with their families. This is not to, to go into that. Pero, you know, we have to also see that there's a gendered aspect of it. Yeah. When our men were the ones leaving to work in Saudi Arabia, they were seeing as performing the job of a good provider. Yeah. Then, when it became the mothers who left, they were questioned. Yeah. What kind of a mother are you to leave your children? Mm -hmm. Or, are, you know, what kind of mother would, would bear to be away? from their child. And I always, always tell this story. When I did that uh, series about who takes care of Nanny's children, I had this whole idea of asking the, my, my case studies, Paano po kayo nagpaalam? I thought they had like some kind of family gathering. Okay, mag-usap tayo. Kailangan ni mama umalis, etc. No, there were so many of them who didn't even get to who didn't even say goodbye. They yeah. chose not to say goodbye. Yeah. And for a while, it was like, I couldn't imagine. Right. Ha, bakit po? Why? I don't know how to even ask the question. But what they said is, one, pag nagpaalam ako, hindi sila papayag. Mag-iiyakan lang kami. Mm -mm. Mawawalan ako ng lakas ng loob umalis. Tapos, 
Napapasok na yung andamin na nalang inutang para doon sa recruitment, para sa ganyan-ganyan. And secondly, hindi nila alam kung kailan sila babalik. And then third is like, they also don't want to face. Yeah. Yung, 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 when they say na, how can this mother leave her child? I think there's no other person who asks that more than that mother herself. Yeah, for sure. Right? So even just to have to face that question. So, sabi ko, napaka-unfair nung, nung ganun. The, frame, the, the way it's framed. The way, yes, the way that it's framed. So, um, I would like to see the, yung, yung nakikita natin na ganong impact sa, sa mga OFW families is something that I think we should also look at. Yeah. You know, what has the shape of the Filipino families been like? For sure, there are families that, uh, that, that you know, experience it and then are able to thrive, are able to survive, mm-hmm. but how? Yeah. And then yun na nga yung children. Migration doesn't just happen to the workers, it happens to the children. Yeah. Right? And I've always, the, the kids, the ones who are grown up, malaki na sila, you know, they would say, nung umalis si mama, okay, naintindihan namin. Naintindihan namin dito. Yeah. Pero hindi dito. Right. Ang hirap tanggapin dito. Hmm. And I, every time I say this, when, when I talk about these issues, it's still like, why? Yeah. Why all of us as parents or all of us want to provide a better life for our loved ones? But why is it that people, our other Filipino countrymen, have to go through so much more sacrifice to provide that better life that all of us want to yeah. give our loved ones? Bakit yung baseline kung baga? Or ba, actually, hindi nga siya better life minsan, Anna, eh, no? Parang surviving nga Survival lang siya minsan, nga, eh, no? Yes. Uh-uh. Napaka unfair. Yeah. Hindi ba so parang hindi ba natin ko question yung unfairness of all of that? Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Na bakit ganon? Yeah. Or ako parang ako yung ako yung mig ako yung usabi ko pareho kami ng yung mga respondents ko na migrant mothers pareho mm-hmm. working mothers. Pero sino sabi sa buti ka pa mga ka ka yeah. sa anak mo? Yeah. Parang <laughs> And then I don't realize I didn't realize also the right. things that I took for granted. Right, right. How, how did you navigate then that? As, as a reporter, as a woman yourself, as a mm-hmm. mother yourself, like mm-hmm. how do you? Were these things that you knew going into your reportage of of labor of migration in the Philippines? I'm not. Af- I'm. I mean, I'm not afraid to say that I came into work covering labor migration. Apa Ah, o sige, siguro cases of abuse, cases of yeah. ganyan, di ba? Parang yun ang instinct ko to follow. Yeah. But I was sent on a long-term assignment to cover the impact of uh, migration on you know, OFW families. Mm-hmm. And I, I will admit my biases. Yeah. Na unang-una, akala ko nga, wow, oh, gusto ko mag-film ng very dramatic scene sa airport na nag-goodbye. Yun pala, hindi man lang nila kaya mag-goodbye. Yeah. And then, and then I would have like, okay, meron na naman ako na isip na, okay, dito tayo sa 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 ibang bansa, itanong yun natin kung ano yung mga ginagawa nila. You know, I had all of these biases in my head about what the migrant mother experience would look mm-hmm. like. You know, uh, and then I didn't realize that I had my own biases. Yeah. Na, bakit mo kana man ini one? Yeah. Kasi, di ba parang then I would look back and say, what would you do? Yeah. And I had to ask myself that question. I know I'd do the same thing. I know I'd roll the dice as well. Right. So, yun ang, yun ang, parang, those are just the things that I found out also when I was working on this issue. Oh, I have this story. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I, we were doing an interview in, in Dubai. Mm-hmm. My photographer was this um, Western woman. And so the, my, our case study was talking about how she had just given birth and uh, one month old pa lang yung anak niya, kailangan na niya umalis. And nandun na daw siya sa bahay ng employer niya where she was working and she would lactate. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Because her body still yeah. thinks that it has to provide. Yeah. And, and she would like cry because here I am, my body is telling me I'm a it's mother. Like a reminder. Now. Yes. Oh. But I cannot be with my son. Yeah. And then the son is now alienated and estranged from her. Hmm. So after we did the interview, the, my photographer partner said, what are you still doing here? You have to go home. Immediately, you have to go home right now. 
and and there's you cannot waste another minute. Yeah. And after that, I had to take her aside and say, "You do know that that was a very privileged statement that you made, right? What do you expect her to do?" Yeah. But until she had said that, I didn't realize that I was also keeping those thoughts in in the back of my head, right? Now, talagang I don't know yung 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 that year that I spent really like. Open my eyes to. This is someone who looks like me yeah. and sounds like me, yeah. but has such a totally different life. Yeah. And this is what equality looks like. It looks yeah. like me. Yeah. And how can you? Yeah, it's just the unfairness of of all of that. That's a good reminder, though. Na tuwing tinatanong mo sila, Mm-mm. paano mo nagawa yan? Parang tandaan mo na tinatanong din nila yun probably every night. Um, while they're abroad, away from their families. Yun nga, parang, again, it's, it's just, it's not even chasing a, a big dream, eh. Parang, it's, it's just surviving. Um, especially the context now, di ba? Like, ang, ang inflation, all-time high. Price of food is insane. Correct. So, mga realities na yun. Yeah. And then, what are you going to do? Yeah. But the, the jobs are so limited here. Yeah. For especially for for our for our mothers, right? Mm-hmm. Magsila ng tatrabaho. They still who's going to take care of their yeah. children? Yeah. In, w- wala pang ayon yung factor na yon na yes. parang uh, when they take when they have to get off work because they're pregnant or they're trying to take care of a newborn. Parang walang not all jobs have guarantees or yeah. safety nets na to assure you that you have a job to return to. It's insane. Given na uh, nga, given your experience in covering labor in talking to FWs around the world, no, because um, I always think nga, we started this off, nga, but we always have this notion now. We one we took for granted, yeah, the fact that migration, labor export is a policy in the Philippines. It's always been a reality. But na siguro bata ka pa lang. But ah okay, if my OFW sa family ko. Uh, my tito ako na I only see once a year. We we take it for granted, and then second nga, the notions that the the preconceived notions we have on the motivations and the reasons why kinakaya nila or quote unquote kinakaya nila umalis. What are siguro oh, two two or one thing like top of mind things or kahit two things that you want people to remember when they think about uh, migration, labor export as a policy. And our OFWs in general. I think we should think about one is sa gusto yung panawagan natin sa government. It's about time that we re-evaluate yeah. our migration policy. Because we keep on sending out, mm-hmm. parang or pag kailangan nilang bumalik, alagaan natin. Mm-hmm. Okay, koko kope natin. Mm-hmm. Pero what happens in between? Yeah. What is the everyday of that? What is a uh, And that goes into, yeah. And saan sila magretire? Paritire na tayo. 36 years na, yeah. tiba. Yung mga unang umales, nasa golden years na. Yeah. What's going to happen to them? Yeah. That that's one. Yung mga retiree OFWs natin. And really, I mean, I want to hope. So I want to see where the future migrant, younger migrant workers are going to be. Mm. There's still going to be a demand in the Western countries yeah. for talent. Okay, the, not just because you know they, they, their their populations are aging and they're attracting younger blood. Mm. And then there's all this this digital nomad thing yeah. that the pandemic has given birth to. And yeah. by nature, by it's a digital nomad thing. You gotta know it's going to be some young person yeah. who's a digital nomad. Yeah. So I'd like to see what the new OFW. Yeah. And that can is equal to expat. Yeah. Already. Yeah. What that would look like. Yeah. And what? Because it's a payon bay, de ba na? Meron tayong perception na pag OFW, a low skilled worker. Mm. So tuli tuli na yung mga inaisip na low skilled worker, siguro and not very educated. Yeah. Siguro. The stereotype. Yes. That it persists. Yeah. Resource deprived background. Mm. So, meron tay, meron at meron tayong Instinct to distance ourselves yeah. from that perception. Yeah. Pero paano na kung OFW equals expat? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that something we can dream about? Right. Yeah. Alam mo, we have a lot to talk about. Because you're in the future, na we can re- revisit this. Hopefully, when the policy becomes clearer, because right now, 
kumbaga, ano lang eh, teasers pa lang ng policy ng Marcos administration. Like, you mm-hmm. get a hint of where they're heading toward. Yeah. For sure, it's not gonna stop. Pero hindi pa, hindi pa nalalatag ng talagang black and white, wala pang clear na picture. So, maybe you can talk about that. Um, I would hope before the first, the second sauna rolls out the first year of the administration, hopefully we get a clear picture. And uh, like you, siguro, I'm hopeful also. Na yun nga, no? parang yun, yun yung isang thing din eh. Parang that was part of the discourse before. Yeah. Pero bakit nga ba kung, kung social na trabaho, or pa, alam mo yun, nagiging expat ka, pero bakit kung blue collar work, bakit OFW lang? Parang may lang pa na attached subconsciously. So, Kailangan natin baguhin yun, I think. Kasi it also forms how, I guess, government sees them or treats them din, no? Yeah. Na, uh, na the dignity or the... Not to say na hindi important ang mga OFW natin, pero di ba parang may classist connotations. And, you know, when you think about it, it's just a reflection of the way the country is. Yeah. The country is very classist, yeah. right? May segregation style who we connect with, who we interact yeah. with. Yeah. So it's just it's also a reflection of that. Yeah. Mm. Thank you for joining me today, Anna. Thank you, Bay. It's um, such a very pre- <laughs> thank you. I, I look forward to your discussion. future reporting, um, especially now when the borders are open again. Yes. It's easier to go around. Uh, Yeah. Thank you, Bea, for having me. Oh, if they want to follow you, like where can they follow you on social media or see your reporting pala? So is Twitter still on? With <laughs> Even, uh, I'm still on it. Uh, I am Anna Santos on Twitter and on Instagram, Anna All Saints. Yeah. I'm going to link your past stories under Raptor and even under other publications so they can read also Please, yes. the reporting that you've done on yeah. Um, our OFWs around the world. Thank you again for joining me and thank you for watching. I'll see you next week, probably. Bye. And that has been this week's episode of 36 Years. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for watching. If you have suggestions for future episodes, do leave a comment or you can tag me on uh, Twitter if Twitter is still a thing in your world or on Facebook if that's still a thing in your world. Or you can email me, bea.copinatrappler.com. Uh, check out Rappler's social media pages and um, our uh, pages or channels on Spotify or uh, Apple Podcasts for o- other or other shows uh, that tackle everything from pop culture to politics to news. Um Until then, I'll see you next week. We have interesting um, interviews coming our way. Thank you again for watching. This has been Bay Kupin. I'll see you soon. Bye.